Okay, uh, we're continuing on with the Genesis series, and we're at Genesis chapter 22 today. But before we jump in there, I want to start uh, with two questions. First question, number one, how many of you like taking tests? Now, most people, honestly, they're, they're going to say, no, we don't really like taking tests. And, and I know there's a trauma involved with that, because I still, believe it or not, I still occasionally have that dream, that dream that some of you have had before, where you show up in class, and you haven't prepared, and it's final exam day, and you don't know what you're going to do. Have you had that dream before? Some of you I know have. It's like a weird deal that people have the same dream like that over and over again. But it's got to be connected again with the stress that comes in with, with that taking of tests. And again, most people don't like to do it. Second question, though. How many, how many of you like using things, though, that have been tested, that have been tested. Yeah, big difference. I, I flew back from China on Thursday, and believe me, I was glad as I thought about the fact that all these pilots had been well tested before they were allowed to, you know, fly that jumbo jet. I was very happy that the, the aircraft had been tested. I mean, I got back here to Kona, and I was actually happy that we've got a DMV here, Department of Motor Vehicles, that has driver's license testing, because I was wondering if they had that in China or not, actually. <laughs> It was like, I'm looking at it going, you know, driver's license testing is a good thing. Now that I'm a little older, I wish they'd raise the age to 25, I think, you know, to start driving. I'm sorry. I mean, the idea is we, <laughs> we want to have, have things that are tested because the, the general idea, the general idea is that we like things being tested because generally speaking, what is tested can be trusted or what is tested can be better trusted. It's when things haven't been tested out at all that there's no trust. It's when things haven't been tested out at all that, that you know, we run into problems. I mean, I'm going to get off on a tangent here for just a second. I'm reading a book right now called The Anxious Generation. I don't know if you guys have seen it before. Jonathan Haidt wrote it. And it's looking at the idea of what, what technology has done to this generation uh, of kids. And it, it's not saying that, that it exacerbates um, um, emotional and mental problems. It's saying it causes the emotional and mental problems of a generation. And, and the deal is this with the testing. What, what, what happened is we, we unleashed a technology that was completely untested. Unleashed a technology on a generation of children that was completely untested. And now after the fact, we're seeing the results of that, and now we're doing testing to find out why everybody so screwed up. And, and again, it's a tangent. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with what we're talking about today, but I find it very interesting to, to, to think that, that so many times we test too late, that actually we've got to get into the testing in advance of the too late mark that we reach. And while we don't like tests, I think what we're going to look at today is something that I hope encourages us to, to understand the importance of tests for, for, for us. Um, it is what we're looking at today, actually, in Genesis chapter 22, because we're going to be looking at what is maybe the most famous and most controversial test that God puts somebody through in the Bible. And God does test people. God tests us. The Bible tells us God doesn't tempt people, but he does test people. Now, before we jump into this controversial and famous test, let's um, quickly recap where we are because some of you haven't been around all summer. We started this summer's series in Genesis chapter 12, looking at Abraham. Last summer, we gen did Genesis 1 to 11. This summer, we started in chapter 12 on Abraham, looking at Abraham as the father of faith. And what we've seen so far in the last 11 chapters, chapters 11 to 22, is that Abraham is <sighs> called by God. And God promises him a son. And this promise comes when Abraham's about 75 years old. The... <sighs> The story goes on, and they go through a lot of things, he and his wife Sarah. But finally, finally, about 25 years later, when Abraham is at the age of 100, he and his wife Sarah have the promised son, Isaac. Isaac is born, Genesis chapter 21, if you haven't read it. Uh, the promised son, and he's the promised son through whom um, the promise that Abraham is going to have descendants that outnumber the sands of the sea or the stars of heaven, uh, the promised son through whom um, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is ultimately going to come. 
Now, this is really pretty crazy when you think about it. I mean, put yourself back there. You, you need to do that in Bible stories and in Old Testament particularly. Put yourself back in the situation and try to imagine it. And this is really crazy because here we have Isaac being born to Abraham when Abraham was 100. So you've got the father and the baby both in diapers at the same time. I mean, this is, this is a weird situation. It's something, though, that, that's a reality that we're looking at with, with him. We get to Genesis 22. What happens in Genesis 22? Well, now years have passed. Years have passed since Isaac's been born, and Abraham and Sarah have prospered. They've had their miracle child, and life is good. They've put down roots. They're, they're doing really well. We don't know how old Isaac was at this point. Uh, there are scholars that say he was somewhere between uh, 12 or 13 and 36. I don't think he was on the upper end of that because he's called a lad, a boy. So I'm assuming he's in his young teenage up to maybe 20, something like that. But anyway, let's, let's go on and pick up the story right here in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, where we have Abraham, the prosperous, happy father of the promised child. And this is what it says. Now it came about after these things, is it on the screen? Let's pop it up, guys. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. Pause just a second. God calls, Abraham says, here I am. Think about every time God's called Abraham up to this point. Every time, every single time God has called out to Abraham up to this point, it's not been really good news. I mean, it's been challenging him to give up something that he loved. It's been challenging him to step into the impossible. It's been challenging him to move out of his comfort zone completely. But Abraham responds, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. Now, this is awful. This is what makes it such a controversial passage. You're going, what in the world is going on with that? Well, first thing I think we have to understand is context. Context here is, <clears throat> first, we've got a very good God who's not really going to call Abraham to kill his son, but we're in a cultural system there where the sacrifice of children was not unusual. This wasn't like Abraham is going, whoa, nobody's ever done that before because everybody around him is doing that. They are sacrificing children to these false idols, these demonic entities that call themselves God. And so Abraham is being called by God to do the same thing by the God who has promised the child. This, this creates a paradox because on the one hand, he has the promised son, and on the other hand, the God who promised him the son is now saying, kill the son that was promised. So this creates a, a little dissonance with, with Abraham, and he's, he's wondering, I'm sure, what's going to happen with this. Up to this point, Abraham has shown radical obedience to God uh, through the past 10 chapters of Genesis. He's left everything. He's followed God. He's waited over 25 years to see God's promises fulfilled. And now, this. But Abraham obeys. Abraham sets off. Abraham doesn't delay. God says, go to Moriah. Abraham, it says, gets up the next morning and leaves. Let's look at verses 3 to 8, where it says, So Abraham arose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, the servants that had come with him, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. So Isaac is big enough and old enough to be carrying the load of wood, which means he's no five-year-old. He's at least a young teenager. And he took it in his hand, and he took, Abraham took in his hand, the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac then speaks to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, we got the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, so the two of them walked on together. What we're seeing here is, is Abraham with another exhibition of being the father of faith. And he's showing here maybe the essential nature of what faith is, is all about. The essential nature of experiential faith. Now, let's divide things up here a little bit. 
Abraham at this point is already saved. We've already been told previously that righteousness has been declared upon Abraham because of the faith that's been given him by God. He's, he's not carrying out this act of obedience in order to earn righteousness. It's already in place. But what's moving in his life now is the challenge to act in faith, to have that experience of walking out what God has called him to do in obedience that God has called him to. Faith, as we see it here, is about obedience. And, and I challenge, suggest to you, that faith is always primarily about obedience, not risk. Not risk. I mean, sometimes we get this idea that, that faith is about finding the most audacious thing we can possibly do and step into it and jump into it. Actually, the dumbest thing you can do is climb out on a limb God hasn't called you to climb out on. It's, it's, it's what gives sometimes faith a bad name, actually. As people climb out on limbs that are based on their desires for success or whatever it is they're after, and they say, I'm believing God for a pink Cadillac or whatever it is. And, and in the process of it, you, you then fail, fall, and, and God gets the blame because you've said, you know, you've placed your faith in the God who's going to bring about the fulfillment of your little heart's desires. And, and that's not faith. Faith is obeying God. Faith is obeying God and, and believing his promises and acting on the promises that he's made. Faith is obeying the commands that he's given us. Faith can be big, and it does look risky sometimes, like this with Abraham. But faith can also be mundane, and in some ways, they're both on the same level. Faith that walks in obedience to the Father is faith in who the Father is. And that's what, what Abraham had. Abraham had a faith in who he knew God to be. He wasn't working from formulas. He wasn't working from what other people had told him God did. He was working from a one-on-one, -on -one, face to face kind of relationship with God that, that was based on who he knew God to be by based, based on what he knew the character of God to be, be about. Um, John 14, 21 talks about this in, in, in a way where it tells us, Jesus speaking, that he who has my commandments, the commands of God, the commands of Jesus, and keeps them, that is, acts on them, who does the commandments, he's the one who loves me. We show our love by doing what God says to do, and he'll be loved by my Father, and I'll love him, and I'll disclose myself to him. It, it says revelation comes by obedience. Further revelation, additional revelation comes by obedience. We see a little example of that here with Abraham for uh, chapter 22, because what happens? When God says go out, where does he tell Abraham to go? He says, go to the land of Moriah. He's talking about a region. It's like God saying, go to the big island and sacrifice, sacrifice Isaac. Goes, okay, I'm here in the big island. And, and then he says, when you get there, I'll tell you where specifically to go. And then that's what he did with, with Abraham. He said, I'll, I'll tell you in Moriah which mountaintop to go to, whether it's Hulalai, Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea. I mean, I'm going to tell you eventually where to go, but I'm not going to tell you where specifically to go until you take the first step and go to the general area where I've told you to go. It's, it's the same thing that God does with us today. We want the destination. We want the final destination. God's saying, I'm not going to tell you the final destination until I see that you're going to take the first step towards that destination. Take the first step, and I'll give you the second step. A very simple principle, but one, one that we so often forget as we, we stay in this place where I'm not going to take a risk on obeying God until I see the ultimate destination that God wants to get me to. The ultimate destination God wants to get me to and you to is to take the first step of faith and obedience to what he said. That's where he wants to get us. And then from there, where he wants to get us is the second step that he wants us to take. He wants us to be people who look to him for step-by-step -step direction and not make assumptions, not be presuming, not to, to test him in terms of what we decide to step out to do to try to apply faith to. I mean, we get this whole idea completely backwards sometimes, where we think we're the ones that test God, and he's actually the one who tests us. The Bible says specifically he will test us. The Bible says specifically do not try to test him. And what is it when you, you have a desire for something and you want to place faith in something, but God hasn't told you to do that something, and you try to do it anyway and apply faith? That's testing God. That's testing God, and that's a dangerous place to be. Not just a dumb place to be, a dangerous place to be. And so we, we need to watch out, you know, in terms of how we, how we apply this whole concept of, of faith that, that comes into play. So, so what happens, though, with Abraham? Again, like I said, he's faced with this paradox. God has promised uh, Isaac, who's going to be the child through whom the Messiah comes, and now God has said to kill him. 
Well, Abraham has the longest three days of his life, I'd say. I'm speculating. From the time he left with Isaac and the wood until he gets to Moriah, three days have passed, and for three days he's working out this, this paradox. And he finally, it looks like, comes to a reasoning of faith. And the only way we know about the reasoning of faith is because God reveals it to us in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 19. And it tells us there, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, he did offer up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, and Isaac, your descendants, shall be called. And that's all fine and good, but this is the reasoning of faith that he went through. He reasoned, he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, for which he also received him back as a type. I mean, what, what's that say? It's saying he finally got to the point where he said, God said Isaac is going to be the one through whom the Messiah comes. He's going to be the one through whom all the rest of my descendants are born. God has said to kill him. The only thing I can figure out is God's going to bring him back to life again. God's going to raise him from the dead. I mean, he's not, he's not worried about what we would call impossible. He's talking about a God who he knows can do anything, and he believes that that God is going to be consistent with the promises that he's already given. So what happened from there? Let's finish the story out, Genesis 22, verses 9 to 14. They came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac. Stop one second. Okay. He ties up Isaac and puts him in the altar. Let's say Isaac's 20 by this point. That means Abraham is 120. Who are you going to bet on in a wrestling match or a foot race? I mean, I'm going to go with the 20-year-old. He could have outrun old Abraham. He could have out-wrestled Abraham in a heartbeat, I would think. And yet, he's bound up and put on the altar. What's going on with that? Here's a little Father's Day message maybe in the middle of all this. I think Abraham had a faith that rubbed off on Isaac. I think he had a faith that was passed on to his son, that his son saw operating in his father's life, and Isaac had caught part of that faith. And we've got Abraham here as the, kind of the star of the story here. God's always the star, I know, but Abraham's kind of the star in a way in terms of the human sense of the story as the man of faith. But I got to think that Isaac had a level of faith in all this too, where he allowed himself to be tied up, put on the altar with his father, raising a knife up to kill him, and trusting God himself in a way for all this. Again, I'm, I'm speculating, I know. The Bible doesn't talk about this. The Bible leaves it as a secret. But it lays it out there that, that Isaac is certainly old enough to carry a load of wood up a mountain, and then somehow he gets bound up by a 120-year-old guy and put on the altar. And so I think we're allowed to do a little reasoning of faith too, just like Abraham did, and, and understand how this worked. And I, I think it works by recognizing we've got two men of faith in this story. So he binds his son Isaac, he lays him on the altar on top of the wood, and then Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord, I think it's Jesus, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, and behind him a ram, ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. In Hebrew, that's Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the man of the Lord, it will be provided. That's the first time in Scripture we hear that name of God. Maybe one of the most famous names of God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And so what we have here is, is a picture of, of Abraham father of faith, who is giving us another lesson in faith as we see Jehovah Jireh, the God who always will provide. And an interesting little side note here too, we've got a type of Christ coming into the picture here. Uh, you, you call it the phrases there, the only begotten son, you know, that, that was given up for him. The substitutionary sacrifice with the ram coming in from the bushes where Jesus was the substitutionary sacrifice for us. We've got all of this as a kind of typology that comes in in Scripture that shows us what's, what's going on here. Things we can learn from, uh, from Abraham, though, is faith. And, and again, putting yourself in the story, 
what do we see? We see an autonomous faith. That is, Abraham was, uh, uh, he had a faith that didn't depend on a crowd around him. It didn't depend on a bunch of people going, amen, attaboy, go for it, Abraham. I mean, we need people like that. That's wonderful to have people like that. We're not to forsake our own assembling together. That's a command from God we're to have faith in. But there are times when you and I have to be willing to stand alone. We've got to be willing in terms of what God has given direction on through his word particularly, but, but most commonly through the application of his word and the individual circumstances of our lives, how we're to walk this out. We've got to be willing to stand with an autonomy of faith before God that doesn't depend on somebody else's faith to hold us up all the time. Second thing that we, we see here is that Abraham's faith wasn't religious. I mean, you know, we talk about a little catchphrase, don't be religious, be into relationship. Abraham was not religious, but into relationship because there wasn't any religion. There were no doctrines. There was no Bible. There wasn't any scripture. There was nothing. He had his relationship with God as the only basis on which he could believe anything. And today, we do have doctrine. We do have the Bible, and that is a benefit for us, and we need to stand firm in that. In, in Abraham's day, only relationship, no doctrine. In our day, doctrine, don't let it replace relationship, though. The doctrine that we have is intended to enhance and, and to actually speed up the process of relationship. We're not going to necessarily live as long as Abraham did. We don't have hundreds of years to, to get things straight. We've got a shorter amount of time, so God put it down in writing a little manual said, read this fast and get it straight. And, and in the process, though, we can become people doctrinally oriented to the detriment of relationship. Don't, don't let yourself get cynical about relationship because of doctrine. Doctrine, though, needs to be something that keeps relationship within the confines of reality. Within the confines of reality and not let our imaginations run away into something that isn't really true. So we, we see that and, and we see, again, that his faith was evidenced by this obedience. His faith was tested. Quick question, you've already thought about it. God tested his faith. Did he test his faith because God didn't know how Abraham was going to respond? Did he test Abraham's faith so that he could find out what kind of a faithful man Abraham was? I mean, you can read the scriptures and you can come away thinking maybe that's what it's all about. But again, get back to sound doctrine. We've got the God who is who is sovereign, providential. He has complete foreknowledge of everything that has ever happened and ever will happen. And so, no, nothing catches God by surprise. I would be so, so afraid to get out of bed every morning if there was anything that was going to catch God by surprise on a given day. He knew what Abraham was going to do. The testing was not for God. The testing was for Abraham. You go, well, that's kind of weird. Again, we're back to the idea that nobody likes to be tested, so why, why this, this idea with, with him getting tested? <sighs> why testing? Well, the Bible tells us about that too. Very simple explanation in James chapter 1, at least one aspect of it. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, Consider it all joy, joy, remember that word, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So, before we go to the next verse, consider it joy to be tested, is what it says. You're tested in trials. Testing comes with problems. That's when testing comes. Trials bring testing. You don't get tested so much by the good things that come in life. You get tested by the trials that come in life. You say, well, I've gotten tested before by how I handle the millions of dollars God has given me. That's because that is a problem, and you don't even realize it's a problem. That is a trial, and you don't realize it's a trial. It's the idea that anything that involves a test is connected with a problem or a potential problem and a trial. And we're being told here, by God, consider it joy when he gives you these problems, these trials that are tests of faith because the testing of your faith produces endurance. What in the world? Let's finish it up here, and then we'll talk about what that all means. Next verse, verse 3. Is that verse 3 on there? Okay. Uh, what's going on with this? What's going on with this? It's the idea that, that testing happens in order for us to evaluate where we are. 
Now, if you're a competitive person like I am, testing is so that you can evalu evaluate where you are in comparison with everybody else so you can make sure you're way up here and they're down here. That's not the way God wants us doing it. Testing ideally is about discovering where we need to do some work, to discovering where we need some help, to discovering where we need to change and reevaluate in terms of how we're living. David, in, in the Psalms, you might remember this, David asked God to test him to test his heart. Have you ever asked God to do that to you, to test your heart? No, I haven't. But, but David did it because he had a heart after God, and he had an understanding that the tests provide a mirror. James talks about this later in another section where Scripture is like a mirror, where we look at Scripture and we see who we are and how we stand up in comparison with God's standards. And testing does that too. Testing is about helping us evaluate where, where we stand with God so that we can do remedial work. It's not that the tests come to show that you're a loser. It's not the tests coming to show that you've got grade F and you're never going to go beyond that. It's testing that comes to show where changes need to happen, where work needs to take place. And, and this is what David was after. I think this is what God wants, wants us after. It's a testing that helps us understand whether we have real faith or false faith. I think during COVID, a lot of people discovered that they didn't have real faith. They had false faith because they went completely berserk, off the rails, and forgot that we had a sovereign God that was in control of the situation. A, 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 a false faith versus a real faith comes into play in a lot of different circumstances. One area uh, where false faith comes in is where people have inherited faith, where you have that inherited faith, and you know what I'm talking about. People who say, I've been a Christian all my life because I was born in a Christian home. I was raised in a Christian home. Therefore, by osmosis, I am a chosen one of God. I'm a son or a daughter of God through Jesus Christ because my mom and dad were. That's an inherited faith, and, and you may be actually go to be able to go along and fake it for a while that way until the trial comes, until the test comes, until something happens that rocks your boat, and, and you find that, that I don't have any trust in God. I don't have any belief that God is there for me, that God's behind me, that God is with me, and, and that test is something that we need to have joy in as it's revealed. Um, Shallow faith is another kind of false faith. It's the kind of faith that's, that's, that's you know, the, the, the idea that we just don't stick, where we've got shallow roots. Jesus told a, a parable about this in, in Matthew and in Luke, where, you know, seed goes into the ground, and because the, the soil is so shallow that when trouble comes, people are, are going to be gone. They're going to be gone. I mean, I, I hate to say this, but six months from now, some of you are not going to be around here. Things are good for you right now. You're happy right now. But six months from, you, from now, something better comes along in terms of an opportunity, and you're going to jump into it. I'm not talking about an opportunity within a church, within a church. I'm talking about an opportunity to do something that sounds like fun that causes you to abandon God completely. And I say that because it's happened like repeatedly over the past 25 years. It's something that shows shallow faith. It's something that shows false faith, not, not real faith. You can switch churches if you want to. I'm not talking about that. Go to another church, but go somewhere that's Bible believing. But also, the, the, the third thing is a conditional faith. A conditional faith that, that believes God only as long as things are going along like you want them to go along. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive you as Father. I'm going to obey you, God, as long as I'm seeing the results very quickly of this, this faith. And that conditional faith is, again, a kind of, of a false faith. The, the idea, again, is to, to ask God to examine, to ask God to test. I mean... If you started having physical issues with your physical heart, I mean, if you started having that, that crushing pressure on your heart that's supposed to be indicative of, you know, heart failure or something, what are you going to do? Well, you're going you're gonna to ask somebody to check it out for you, probably. You're going to say, check this out. Test me. Put me on the treadmill. Put me, you know, through whatever testing processes you're going to put me through because I want to find out if something's wrong with my heart. I don't want to be, you know, completely in the blind about this. I want to find out. And I want to find out then what I need to do to get it back to a good, healthy state. Fine and good. <laughs> Problem with that is your heart eventually is going to give out. You're going to die. But we've got a spiritual heart that is going to continue on for eternity. 
and we've got a lot less interest in having that, that spiritual heart tested. We've got a lot less interest in having, having any kind of test run on that to, to find out where the problems are so that they can be addressed now. It's, it's what, what God, I think, wants to do in terms of our tests. Tests come in a lot of different forms in life. Tests come, the test of fear comes in. The test of bitterness comes in. Are you going to stay bitter? The test of, of success comes in. The test of sex comes in. Maybe the biggest test for a lot of us, the test of marriage comes in. I mean, the testing grounds that God puts us through in terms of, of walking out the reality of what it means to be one who believes that God is there that he knows best how to live, and that he's given us some commands and directions on exactly how that's supposed to look like, and actually enjoy the testing, take joy in the testing, and are there to encourage each other on in the testing that happens. You know, one of the weirdest things happened this uh, past trip to China. Uh, we happened to hit right when school was ending for the high schools and junior high schools, as we would call them, and and we were driving down one of the main thoroughfares in um, um, well, in the city Pine was in, and there were these schools, and the schools were very nice looking, gated usually, and the schools had police like all around them, and the sidewalks were blocked off in front of them, and there were hundreds of cars parked out there with people all crowded around, and they all had blue ribbons tied to their cars or were waving around blue ribbons in the air. And asked my wife, said, what's that all about? He said, well, it's finals this week for junior high and finals for high school. And the parents and the families and the friends are all out there. And they stay out there all day long. They're out there yelling these kids on, encouraging these kids on to do well on the test, to do well on the test. I mean, they take the testing so, so seriously because, well, at 14, it makes the determination on what high school they can go to from there. And maybe they're not going to even go into high school, but they'll drop off and go into, you know, some other industry where they don't need an education. From high school, it determines what college they go to. Uh, Pine's brother was a high school teacher, and he was so grateful that there had been no suicides in his class yet this year. I mean, they take the testing, the point is, they take the testing seriously. They take it for evaluation purposes. It's, it is evaluation. It does determine their, their future and their destiny, but it's an evaluation that also determines where the holes are that need to be filled in, particularly for the junior high age group, so they can do well as they move on to determine final destinations as they move on from, from there. But anyway, anyway, the idea for us is, what is a test of faith? Very simply in summary. A test of faith can be summarized as any situation where, where we're put in this place of choosing between obedience to what God has said and what we want, or and what we think makes sense, or and what conventional wisdom promotes, or, or between what God says and what we think is the most loving thing to do. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of wondering today if maybe one of the, the most dangerous areas of compromise that, that we enter into when we have a command from God is a compromise that comes, the, the failing of the test that comes, as we choose what we think is the most loving thing to do towards an individual as opposed to what God has said. And I'm talking about confronting sin. I'm talking about addressing things that are culturally and societally acceptable, but which God says are, are off the charts in terms of what's permissible behavior from him. And you can go there yourself in terms of what all those variables are in terms of, of, of you know, sexual activity, in terms of identity, in terms of just how you live out life. I mean, you can call it archaic, old-fashioned, whatever, but I think the better word is biblical in terms of of the standards by which God wants to have in place in terms of how life is lived. And it's all a test. Life is one long lesson. One long lesson. And it is packed full of tests every day. Every decision, every choice that we make is in, in terms, in, in some form, a, a, a test. It is not a test to determine your salvation. It is not a test that determines heaven or hell. Just like with Abraham, the, the destination of heaven or hell comes by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that alone, and it's a done deal. 
But from there, those additional tests of faith that come in are about experiential faith, about doing faith, about walking out obedience, which carries with it the the blessing and promise of, of reward that God has for us that we need to be paying attention to. It, it's the idea that, that God has said that, that we need to have a one word answered to the most important thing that we want to accomplish in life. Okay, if I were to ask you, what is, and we're about through here, got two more minutes, okay? If I were to ask you, what is one word to describe the one thing that's your goal in life, what would you say? I mean, one word. Success, maybe. Somebody had some other words in the last service, but, but I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. Matthew 25, we're told, get before the throne. And for those who've walked out the life God wanted him, them to walk out, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful. Faithful servant. Faithfulness, that's the one thing. That's the one thing. Because faithfulness encompasses obedience. Faithful, faithfulness encompasses basically everything that, that God wants us to be involved in. It's, it's God glorifying. Faithfulness gives God glory. Faithfulness is about his glory. Faithfulness does everything that we talk about every Sunday and puts it into one word that, that puts us in a place really where, where hopefully we can know what to do. The test questions for you this week, every time you have a test of faith, is going to ultimately be this. Number one, do you believe God is in control? Do you believe God is in control? Number two, do you believe God is good? And number three, do you know God as Jehovah Jireh? Do you know him as Jehovah Jireh? If you do believe God's in control, if you do believe God's good, if you do know God as Jehovah Jireh, you're going to pass the tests. Every time. Every time. If you don't, then you're going to be afraid. If you don't, you're going to question whether God has your best in mind. If you don't believe he is the one who does provide, then you're going to be constantly in that position of thinking, you've got to make everything happen or it's not going to happen. It's not about passivity. It's about a different kind of activity, though, an activity that doesn't give you or me any credit, an activity that gives God the glory as he proves himself as Jehovah Jireh. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love, your goodness, your grace, your provision. Thank you, Father, for tests. And I ask that this week, <sighs> this is dangerous, I know, but I ask this week you would test our hearts, test my heart, and enable us to see, enable me to see. The, the places where changes and adjustments need to happen. Father, we want to stand before your throne, and we want to hear those, those words spoken to us. Well done, good and faithful servant. We ask this, Father, for your glory, for our good, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.